involved in human rights circles. And I always wondered like, what would it have been like to be on that boat? Um, I also like, you know, being a very precocious <laughs> and like rule breaking child, I would go on like Facebook groups for like queer Egyptians, um, et cetera. And I, so I knew a lot of people who were like 20 in 2001. Um, and they became my friends. And I would like, even if they were not on the boat, they knew people who were, or they knew people who were, had been arrested, or they knew people who had had similar incidents happen to them. Uh, and obviously this is all informed by class and the intersectionality of regions and so on. I was like, even before I moved to the US, I was very much like a third culture kid living between a lot of different places. So I had a certain access to privilege that was different, but I always like was interested in that. And it like, when I came into, again, my first playwriting experience with Abi Sheikh, my playwriting mentor in that class, I, he asked us like, what are things you want to write about on day one? And I always thought like, I want to tell stories of more gay Arabs. Um, and that has evolved over time. Like since I have migrated to the US, I've finished college. I uh, have become much more interested in migration. I've become much more interested in gender nonconformity and transness. Uh, I'm much more interested in my work um, you know, becoming more holistic than just talking about like a gay cis male experience. Um, and I'm, yeah. much, I'm thinking about class much more critically, but it continues to, not just as a playwright, but as, as a TV writer, as a dramaturg, um, as a producer, I am interested in telling stories about um, people or communities, not in a tokenizing way, but exploring um, people's experiences and rendering people who have not had the chance to be represented fully uh, in ways that are, and often that is that intersects with my own experience, but it does not always, and I think that that's okay. Absolutely. So, so many brilliant things you said there, uh, Adam, and I want to I want to highlight um, how you spoke about you know seeking stories sometimes to help you understand and bringing also Carol Martin. She's she's my one of my favorite scholars. Yes. I'm so glad to learn. Like I want to ask you more about that class. Oh my God, Martin, you would love her in real life. I love <laughs> I love her definition of documentary theater, saying yes. that it's you know it's superior to mainstream media because it's more it's subjective, not because it's yes. objective. And yeah. this resonates with what you're saying about you know seeking these stories to understand. And it's also like really bringing your own sometimes personal history to them and sometimes not really, sometimes just, and that was my experience doing documentary theater. My drive has been, when I do documentary theater has always been, you know, there's something that happened that I cannot wrap my mind around it. I cannot That's really understand That's how could this happen or you know so and that would be the the you know the starting point but then the research and and the you know the process yeah. kind of inform the outcome and and the process itself so Absolutely. this is also so great I want to ask you like because you spoke about all of this how how do you see the process different between writing a documentary piece like Memorial, for instance, which is totally based on, I believe, on verbatim interviews that you and your collaborator, Ariana uh, Stuckey, is that how you say the last Stuckey. name? Yeah. Stuckey. Ariana Stuckey and, and yourself, you did interviews with survivors of the shooting that happened in uh, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And then Drowning in Cairo, which is which takes a real event as its inspiration, but then you go on and you craft a story that's not necessarily true, right? Uh, you know, about centered about the life of these three Arab gay men. Like how how is that process different for you yeah. as a playwright? Right. What's you know. How do you experience it? I'll name that every play is different. Uh, so I've only made one documentary or verbatim piece uh, so far. I'm about to start my second one, which I can't talk about yet. But uh, but I um, I I've my second one will not be the same as the first. It will not be. It will not start with the same kind of interviews. It might be documentary, but not verbatim. Um, and same with my plays. Drowning in Cairo is not my only um, fiction or narrative play. Um, and each one has had a different story. Drowning in Cairo came again from me hearing this every time I talk to an older Egyptian gay man, hearing the ghost of, of Queen Boat being like what people always talk about and me being like, what was this event? Um, me also like being a nerd. I was initially a sociology or social research major, 
Um, I just read a lot of human rights reports about it. And so I had all this knowledge. So it's not a documentary, but it's very much based on like details of what happened on that boat. Um, and then hearing people talk. And I did speak to a couple of people who had been on the boat uh, before writing, not with the intention of writing. It was just that we had been in the same space. Um, but I will say that character is often where I start uh, mm -hmm. with, um, with fiction, fiction or narrative work. I'm often like, who is this person? Um, I, I credit this to Jessica Blank and to my friend Ariana Stuckey who introduced me to Jessica Blank. Um, the idea of the core wound of um, who is this person? What is their backstory? Where did they grow up? What is the street they grew up on? Who was like, who was their first date? Who was their first crush? Who was their first kiss? Were they middle class? Were they upper class? But also like when we are meeting them, what is the thing that like they're hiding from? What is their core wound that they're always... Um, not trying to avoid and and then what is um how do i put it what how do they how they have they crafted their lives and what is their coping mechanism so that they cover that core wound and then what are the plot of the play has to basically destroy that core wound and they have to like actually change or transform mm -hmm. is how i or maybe they don't but that's the point yeah. um but that's how I often think I always start from character. I'm actually just while we're talking about different medias, like just starting to, to move from theater to other mediums, screen mediums, and like working with collaborators who don't start from character. I'm so lost. People are like, what if this happens? And I'm like, but why is it happening? Like for me, a Whose play, story is that? Yeah. I'm also a very slow writer until I'm not. So I can spend like eight months developing character. But once I really know the characters and I start writing a draft, the draft will come out in two weeks. That's but like, I, it's never, I, I can't do that without living with the characters for months and months and like almost trying to become them. Um, yeah. Um, so that's how narrative stuff work. With Memorial specifically, I won't talk about like my documentary theater process because I think it'll be different with every piece. I, sure. I know the upcoming piece will definitely be different. But with Memorial, I want to give credit to Ariana Stuckey, who was my dearest friend in the world and when the event happened she I was traveling and she reached out to me and I didn't know that it was happening uh actually I first the first thing that happened was a couple of people reached out to me to ask me if I was okay and I was like uh, I was like in Sweden at the time and I was like yeah like why wouldn't I be okay and then they told me about it and I was like oh that's that's terrible but also like at the same time there were uh, attacks on Jewish synagogues in Pittsburgh and there were things happening uh, in England and I was like for me all of these events like equally are horrific like I'm not more affected by this event because it happened to a mosque in a mosque um, but Ariana was really really affected by the event and we got to talking a lot and I was curious why are you so affected by this event mm -hmm. and she she really had the impulse of like going there and she thought I could make a documentary play, but also maybe I go and people are not ready and that's okay. And, you know, we both studied with Carol. And so we knew all the processes. We knew how like Laramie Project did it. We knew how Yael Farber did it. We knew how um, the Truth and Recon Reconciliation people in South Africa did it. And people often would speak with trauma victims. She also studied a lot on trauma right. uh, years out. And so the fact that she was going two months in was like, this is it right are you ready um and so on and but we ultimately decided that she would go and if people were not ready to talk to her that was fine um and so yeah I want to give credit to that that Ari the interviews were done by Ariana she conceived of the piece I was initially functioning as a dramaturg before I became a co-writer but I was also supporting her with like my knowledge of Islam and like helping draft questions for the interviews and simultaneously once an interview was done I was um leading a team of like 30 transcribers, transcribing all the interviews. Um, mm -hmm. But um, she did all of that and she went there and surprisingly 17 people really wanted to talk to her and they all had something really relevant. And not all of them were Muslim. Some of them were part of the, some of them were part of the government. Some of them were, uh, were people who were very upset. They were gun rights advocates, people who were upset that the New Zealand had taken such strong uh, gun law um, precautions, but it was, people from different facets of life in Christchurch who were um, who wanted to talk to her and had something serious that they wanted to say. Um, and so we came back with thousands of pages of transcripts and we just started building like, and it became like, we have thousands of pages. We can write 
15 different documentary plays. What is the play? What are, is the thing we're actually trying to explore? And mm -hmm. we made that the guiding question. And the guiding, and that for us became um, how do humans, individuals, and communities attempt to create narratives to overcome trauma? And how do they process an insurmountable loss that causes trauma? Um, and then from there, uh, we were interested in also how that trauma, how these different ways of coping with trauma could hurt each other or intersect with each other. Um, and so that's how Memorial was built. Um, but yeah, I feel this is the very long answer to your question. That's a, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. And you're right. Like I think with every documentary piece, the process is different because the material you're using might be different. In mm -hmm. the memorial case, I believe it was on the interviews, but sometimes if you're using like hybrid, what we call hybrid documentary, when you're using documents or studies or you know other material, it's definitely it becomes a different uh, different process. Uh, I wanna I wanna pause for a moment because we have a we have a question actually in the chat and I wanna lift it up from American Iraqi play, uh, poet Bo Busoleil. Hello, Bo. Um, Bo is asking. Theater has so much to do with the human body, and that is part of its po power for me to see the narrative inhabited by someone so close is magical. How much of a sense of the body enters your work as you write? As a queer writer, are you even more aware of the human body since the body of a queer person has for long, for so long frightened theater producers into only presenting them as stereotypes on the stage? Yeah, I that's thank you. That's an excellent, excellent question. I think I used to be, again, my bankrupt, my I I was as a as a teen or as like a child, I read like I was the kind of person who read like one book every day. And so I came from such a literary background. And again, when I came into college, I wanted to study literature. So when I first made this transition to playwriting, I just like kept, we, I had, we had this one theoretical professor who always talked in every play we would talk about. She would ask us the first question after was, how do these bodies function in space? And I, 18 year old me was like, that's such an annoying question. What the fuck does that mean? Uh, sorry, expletives. Um, and, um, and that question is so important to me now. It means so much uh, because as I, my plays used to be like, talk, 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 talk. And Drowning in Cairo is one of my earlier plays. So it is more that than some of my more contemporary plays. But um, having seen more plays and seen how bodies function and embody text, um, I think playwrights have such an intense responsibility of thinking about um, you have the responsibility that you're putting words in someone's body and put in someone's mouth and what that means and how bodies function differently. Um, so yes, as a queer, I was very, one of the most, one of the first observations I had when I was meeting people who had been on the queen boat uh, or people who even knew someone who um, were on the queen boat and you know, queer people, Oh, not a stereotype, but often there's like levity and fun and humor and sarcasm and irony, but like the way people embodied or would look down or would look differently as they were talking about this thing was something I was really fascinated, not fascinated or like, um, you know, sad to see, but also somewhat like intrigued by as an anthropologist or as an artist. Um, but yes, I think like in, in the play, if you see it, when you see it, there is very much like how each of these men's bodies and movement and physicality fundamentally changes um, as a result of this incident and how this incident, how their bodies are being policed within this incident is very much part of this. Um, and it's become, it's become more, um, it's become more of a thing in my work in later pieces with, um, and thanks to the, again, to quote or to give credit where credit is due to my collaborator, Ariana, for whom bodies, bodies and like how the bodies are embodying and taking up space are like central to how she makes work. And that, and so she brought that background to us building Memorial and that became very central to how we were thinking about it. For example, um, Memorial has, as it, in its current draft has seven, act, requires seven actors or seven bodies on stage. And, and some of these tracks are hard to cast. Like our lead is a Bangladeshi man in his late fifties who um, is disabled or um, um, is in a wheelchair and um, is paraplegic. And even in New York, like we were most of the, where there's the biggest abundance of actors. Uh, it is almost impossible to cast this role entirely accurate, entirely authentically, or with these, all of these, 
demographics in mind. Right. And so we've always had the question of what does it mean if a different kind of body is embodying these words? And how do we um, acknowledge that to our audiences? So we're not claiming that Farid's man is not disabled or so, but how do we create the dissonance between the body or, or emphasize and explore what it means that there is a dissonance between the words that were told in the body of the actor? I mean, we could think about that with like something like Hamilton or um, what does that dissonance mean? And so what we did in memorial is we actually have recordings from the actual interviews and so this doesn't happen the whole script obviously it happens like maybe five times in the script mm -hmm. but an actor who's clearly not 59 or bangladeshi or paraplegic will say the line and then the recording of the actual person will say it and it is a moment that invokes humility for the actor because they then realize that like I will never fully be this person and I will never fully be able to experience what this person did. Um, but it's also a reminder for the audience that these actors are like coming in as themselves with their identities, telling you the story rather than like they are these people. Um, so, so yeah, that's again, my short answer. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Actually, I just want to, you know, uh, highlight again, one thing that you, that Bo asked about and you, beautifully responded to which is the idea like the idea of like stereotype typing characters like queer arab or queer in general and this is one thing that really stood out for me when i read crowning in cairo and that was it really offers a very complex alternative reality like a narrative to the often simplistic and reductive narrative about w what it means to be gay in the middle east so that was something that you know i i really enjoyed it in this play i we don't want to give away obviously like the story or um, more juicy details but that's something that i hope audiences will be able to see it's very empowering in in its own way so adam this, and i, I want to um, actually add to that and mm -hmm. say that like sahar um you challenged me a little bit in the beginning of our collaboration in a way that I really appreciated where um, it's, again, I wrote this play when I was in college, but um, up until like three months ago, the character descriptions in the script were like describing how each of these three men looked in my head when I was writing them. And Sahar was like, okay, but that's not what we want to put in a casting call. We actually like, who are these people? Like, what is their characters? What is their personality? Um, what is the thing that makes them tick? And I suddenly found myself writing like two sentences about each of these men that like was so much more important than Absolutely. the fact that one of them was short or lanky. Like it didn't matter. Like it was, and I was like, oh, right. Like I've thought about like the closeted bro -y dude as like a, who ends up being a policeman. Again, like, sorry. Um, I was like, a 200 pound muscular dude with a big mustache, but like, what if he's not that? What if he's actually like very femme and that's, and that's part of what this character embodies. And so we became interested in like what it, cause I don't think people's, the archetype, like what we think, like if you look at what someone looks like in a photo and then how they actually embody that body is not like, uh, is more often than not, not accurate to what our stereotypes and what our brains want to, um, you know, make snap judgments about. And so I was very, I'm very excited by how we are going to complicate some of these things with how bodies Me change, too. how bodies morph. Me too. I can't wait really to, to be in a rehearsal room with you, Adam. I want to say like this um, conversation is just a starter really for us. I'm hoping we're going to have many more of these around drowning in Cairo, especially when we start working. And I wanted really to, to use it as a chance to introduce you to our community, get to know you a little better. So one thing I did is I reached out to uh, friends and collaborators you've worked with, and I have some surprises for you. So we have, um, I have a surprise guest. Wait, what? In, I don't know. Yeah. It's, you're gonna be like let's see we have a surprise guest waiting in the weight room I want to admit right away please Wendy can we have our guest join us literally what is please happening say, right now show your face <laughs> oh hi. my god hi <laughs> so, hi um, so. I 
so crazy. People watching, this is Amin El Gamal, um, Egyptian American actor, active in theater, film, and television. That I've had the you know the pleasure of meeting recently in person, um, and obviously we spoke about drowning in Cairo and about you, Adam. And I said, you know, we have Adam in the no summary. Can you come and say something about your experience reading the play in 2018? Because for those of you who don't know, um, Golden Thread actually um, gave gave drowning in Cairo. I believe it's very first home in in a development workshop with Evren and Turanj. Uh, and others, and Amin was reading um, Moody. Yes. So, so I'm hi, Amin. So, so happy that you're I'm here. I'm so happy to be here. This is so fun and so exciting. <laughs> wow. Um, I just wanted to share, Adam, how profound that reading was, because I grew up in the Bay Area, and um, I struggled, you know, I had my own internal struggles and my struggles with my family culturally um, and a lot of progress has been made but even so a lot of times we don't talk about these issues explicitly and the reading gave such a safe space for us to just unapologetically bring this stuff up and and like shine a spotlight on it and to be surrounded by all these people like these tants you know and <laughs> my parents my brothers <laughs> And these people I actually grew up with and, and some I don't know as well, but to be and to do it in a place where I grew up was incredibly profound. It was frightening, but it was also like it gave the, the community an opportunity to show up and to be supportive, which I don't think we always we don't always do. And a chance to have like a safe space for like some kind of dialogue. So I just wanted to share that experience with you. Oh I have so many feelings right now. Sahar, why did you do this to me? Um, this is such no, like an Oprah move. <laughs> that is such an Oprah move, actually. No, but um, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I we had a couple of, um, when I was still in college, I, when I was developing it for my thesis, we had a, a short workshop that was in India with my playwriting mentor and then one in Abu Dhabi, but obviously in neither of those, um, did I actually work with a queer Arab person? And I remember I was having, again, I had not decided to move to the US at that point yet. And I was having this existential crisis of like, I can't present this play in Egypt. Uh, it's also in English because I'm like, was raised in a certain way in a certain place. And so it's not actually accessible to most of the queer Egyptian community. Um, I, I can't really present it in the UAE where I lived either. And um, I don't know who this play is for. I don't just want to present it to like white audiences. Um, and Catherine, again, shout out to Catherine. I really wish she was here. Catherine uh, was like, send this to Evren, send this to Golden Thread. I actually didn't know Evren at that time. She said, send this to Golden Thread. And I did, I was just like a cold, random email, middle of my spring, the spring of my senior year. <laughs> And, and I didn't hear back for like a few months. And then a few days after graduation, I was still in Abu Dhabi and I got this email and I was like, what? Like, what do you want to do with my flight? What is happening? Who are you? Um, and so I, I, I flew, I called it my graduation trip. I flew to San Francisco and I've always wondered who this play was for. I never, never thought that its audience, first of all, I never thought that I would work with a queer Egyptian actor whose experience is fundamentally different from mine because I did not grow up in the U.S. at all, who uh, was going to um, find value in working on this play. And so just having the privilege of doing that, uh, of being with you and seeing you, um, seeing people be affected by the work, because, you know, as a writer, you're always like, like, does anybody care about this as much as I do? Does it matter? Is this just all like vanity? Uh, and so just seeing you, I mean, and then obviously working with Khaled Abul Naga, who directed that reading. That's right. Um, again, a very intergenerational conversation between three different queer Arab men from across contexts um, was so profoundly meaningful. And then having our audiences again be like uh, like a group of like diasporic, mostly mostly Egyptian, mostly Arab American, older um, not older but like um, older women. Uh, who are primarily not queer, who were there for this work. Like, I just never thought that like an Arab straight audience would sit through this play and be like, yeah, that's that's fine. We are finding value and meaning in this. And just seeing that, and like, they took me out for like 
with a bottle of champagne after. And I was like, people actually like appreciated this. And I never thought that I would. And honestly, like I always, I credit Everin because he was the person who read that play from a cold email. I credit him for, for, um, for um, identifying Khaled as a person. I credit, um, and then casting Amin and other Egyptian folks who were in the piece. Um, but I think like, I don't think I would have moved to the US or like continue to write plays if it weren't for that experience. And so I'm, it feels like such a, a, com- a homecoming to, for this play like many years later to be getting its premiere here. That's so, so beautiful. I just want to send our regards to Evren Ochikan, who is our very own resident artist and also right now an associate uh, artistic director at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I want to send regards to Khaled Abunaga, who did a fantastic job on that piece. Yes. Um, obviously to Turanja Gezarian, uh, yes. the champion of it all, and, and to you both. So to, I mean, um, I want you to stay on please because we have more surprises for Adam and I want you to witness and experience that. So I'm gonna invite Wendy. Um, so some folks, Adam, uh, wanted to share some messages and questions, but they really did not, you know, weren't available to join us live, but they did send some video messages. So I want to show you the first. I want to name that like Sahar pitched this to me as, I want people to know that I did not come here with the expectation of like being serenaded. Sahar no, I'm sorry. Me, like, I'm sorry. We're going to like have like an open work session, playwright director, talk about our backgrounds, like with people. And I was like, that sounds cute. Let's do it. I didn't know this was going to be like a whole thing. It's all about you, Adam. You're our star. I want to talk to you <laughs> and hear more about your... Okay, we'll, we'll get more time. There's we can more do that time offline. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you're looking at all the love we're receiving in uh, both of you so in the crazy. chat. This is so intense. I'm so when, happy. Yeah, that's great. Wendy? <laughs> Hi, oh Adam. God. Terribly sorry that I was unable to make it for the live online celebration of you. Um, I hope you know that I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of who you are, who you've become and all that you have yet to achieve. I'm super, super excited for your premiere of Drowning in Cairo with the Golden Thread team. I think it's going to be a wonderful exploration of the work. And I really think it's the kind of material that needs to be on our stages today. So I wish you well. I wish you a lot of um, you know, good, good vibes um, as you move into this process. I wish you love, growth, lots of luck. And I can't wait to be bringing all my colleagues and friends to watch uh, in the spring, I believe. So in the winter, um, big, big hugs. And I hope to see you again soon. Mabruk, see you. Oh my God. How do you even know Karishma? Like, how I, I have questions. Well, well, I have to give credit to Catherine Corre because I was like, Catherine, Give me some names. <laughs> and I obviously, like, you know how, Gaff, how generous Catherine is. <laughs> oh my God. But I have to say, so this is Karishma Bahgani, a producer, researcher, theater maker from Mombasa, yeah. Kenya, for those of you um, who don't know. And she's currently pursuing a PhD in theater and performance studies at Stanford School of Humanities and Sciences. And I can't wait to meet you, Karishma, when you watch this. You'll hear this, um, Adam. Yeah, Karishma is one of my dearest, dearest friends. And when she got into, uh, when she was like started her program at Stanford and then just a few weeks later, I learned that you were going to feature the play in the season. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to come see you more often. And also like, I want you to like be a part of every part of the process of this play. Because Karishma is also the key producer on Memorial and is just one of the most brilliant people who does like, not just like work between the middle, uh, between, um, She's from East Africa, not just work between East Africa and the US, but she's very interested in South-South collaborations and she deeply inspires me as a director and a producer. Um, and yeah, I know some of Karishma's friends are also here in the chat. Hi, Marina. Hi, Marina. And, and uh, yeah, we can't wait for to meet Karishma at uh, Golden yeah. Thread and learn more about your work. I We have two other messages. Oh my God, two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've done some research. Let's see, Wendy. I'm. Hello, Adam. It's Ariana <laughs> tuning in from our sweet graduation photo in our kitchen. 
For those who don't know me, my name is Ariana, and I am a close friend slash often collaborator slash roommate of the wonderful Adam El Sayi. And Adam, I was thinking of when I very first spoke to you, you told me that you had the hopes of someday creating a play out of The Great Gatsby. And specifically that what you loved about The Great Gatsby was the fact that the story sometimes breaks out of time and space in exciting ways that gives us the best experience of the story. Um, and for anyone who's coming to see Adam's work, that's what you'll receive. That's what you'll get is, I think Adam is an incredible crafts person <laughs> of narrative and how one event leads to the next event in ways that still are surprising and innovative to the form and to to the story itself. So my question for you, Adam, would be what excites you so much about narrative in theater, about using story uh, events leading to the next events in theater? And uh, how do you get inspired to play with them? What what inspires your choices? Uh, within narrative structure that's kind of heady but i bet you'll give a good answer so much love from new york and i'll see you soon oh my god we had to bring in ariana come on adam what is i i, I barely heard her question because i was getting so emotional <laughs> <laughs> this is wild um so this is Ariana. Did I ask the that. question? I don't know. It feels this Ari just to say to everyone listening, this Ariana is an actor and playwright and currently an MFA acting student at the Juilliard School. And Ariana is the friend and collaborator Adam was referring to when um, he spoke about uh, memorial. Uh, and and Ariana is asking you about you know what um, you know what inspires you in the narrative in, in narrative structure like I think we we did speak a little bit about that but I'm happy to have you listen again to the question. No 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 I think I I, I think I, I I have it together. Uh, wow um, I think when I first wrote Drowning in Cairo I mean I can talk about other my work generally or like I wrote Drowning in Cairo linearly. Um, and it was actually really boring <laughs> as a first draft when it was linear because you were seeing these kids as they were like figuring out they were queer, uh, but there wasn't, uh, I was interested in, I'm interested in how we see things in retrospect. I'm currently dramaturging Our Town, uh, which is one of my all time favorite plays, not because of all the like Americana stuff, but because of the third act where we see Emily looking at her 12th birthday. Um, it's funny, Our Town was never a direct influence on driving in Cairo, or I never thought of it as such, but I'm interested in like these moments of mundanity or moments where it's just like, here's a bunch of kids that are just talking about like Britney Spears and that's it. Like it's just 12 year olds or 13 year olds talking about Britney Spears, like who cares? Um, but they actually, when you know like what happens next and what, um, what it means, it means so much. And um, Rajiv Joseph's play Gruesome Playground Injuries was the most direct like thing that I looked at and was like, I think I want to do that. Um, and and yeah, that last seat, people all the question that weirdly always comes up in every talk back is, OK, I don't want to say what the last scene is. People ask yeah. why we end at the last scene. And I always say because because it's not linear. That's what I can tell you. Um, and people ask why we end there. And I've always thought like we end there because knowing what was what these kids thought was their lives were going to be and seeing them full of hope about what that life will be knowing what their life actually ends up being is more profound than anything that I can like write about like them saying out loud like I don't think that's as profound as like just the structure of it uh, it's funny I've, I'm actually working on another the, the first project that's like very directly like about queer Egyptian life, it's post-Egyptian revolution. So it's a very different project and it's not for theater, but it's a project that I started thinking about non-linearly a few years ago. And just now um, after it's been not working for years um, and like, I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. And I realized that my first impulse, which was to start 
seven years into the future and then go back is actually what I need to do to make everything that we see as a flashback relevant. So I'm always interested in like what, or I'm also interested in repetition. Thanks to Ariana, that's more credit to Ariana, into like you hear a statement and then, or you see a moment and then you see another moment that's like later or before, and then you see that first moment again and that first moment means something different. I think, I don't know who said this. It's like the A, B to A star. Like it's a, it's a weird nerdy playwriting thing that I don't know how to describe properly right now. Moving on. <laughs> I I want to say I want to say one uh, one thing that you, you just said like uh, also without giving too much of of the play because we're not there yet. But I want to say like one thing also that I read in this play, and I want to ask I mean if you would agree with me that there's so much obviously like heart-wrenching sorrow reflected in the play and the story of the three young men. But at the same time, there is something for me that, you know, kind of felt that this is also a celebration of life and love. And that became really, you know, um, something that, that, that I wanted to highlight. I mean, the phrase that kind of sticks with you is those who tell don't die. This is this we can we can say right we can say that that's the play starts with. Shout out to Khaled. I think Khaled was saying, the one who really insisted on that being there. Um, yeah, yeah, and like I said, my, my impulse ethos with writing was always like to sell, to tell a story for of people and for people, not of people only, but for people who have not been represented and right. or have been represented badly. Uh, right. And for me, it is very much that, um, right. which is to say. Um, Dominique Morisot um, recently tweeted, who's an incredible black playwright, uh, African American, the black American playwright. She tweeted something about how critics always describe black plays as like black joy or black pain or black trauma. And it's like, no, it's both. Like, yes, it's like we all overcome, we all like as marginalized communities, and not just marginalized communities, everyone goes through shit, right? Like, who doesn't? Um, and sometimes you can get arrested and something you can do that but like sometimes you also laugh with your friends and like talk shit and dance to Britney Spears and like sometimes you're horny and make bad choices like that's just the reality of like being a human and I'm just not interested in like joy or trauma or pain as pair as like binaries but like things right. that that's like that create each other right I mean and, sorry um, you were invited to speak and I just took over that's okay no, I agree with you. I think that life is not, you know, a comedy or a drama and it's most interesting and most profound when um, the tone, the tone, for me, I'm really interested in how like tragedy and like comedy almost can converge at the same time, you know, like sort of like the Chekhov thing where one person's life is falling apart and they're the other person's in love and joy and they're in the same conversation somehow, but not, you know, I always find that the most interesting work because that's more how life, you know, is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I can see the concerns with marginalized communities um, and their sort of pain being mined as some sort of balm for, you know, like Western guilt <laughs> or whatever. And, and um, or, or a way to like, um, I know there was a conversation with like these incredible, you know, black centered plays on Broadway, but so many of them also there's the conversation about how so many of them are about like trauma and like how you balance that out. So yeah, it's complicated. I also like, and this is a little bit different, but I guess it's a question for you is because we have different backgrounds, you know, I was curious what you think the role of diaspora queer Arabs, um, artists might be in relation to you know stuff that's going on like in Egypt like that's depicted in Brown and Cairo um because we do have privilege you know and um it's not so much what can we do to like assuage our guilt but like what can, what, what what is our role in the, in the conversation of um, without getting in territory of like pink washing or like demonizing the Middle East further, you know? I mean, just the way you're asking that question tells me that you're the right person to actually have a role, which is to say that like, I've heard the bad version of that question from like 
an older white gentleman in a talk back where it was like, so how do we fix this in Egypt? And it's like, no, stay out of it. Stay in your lane. Um, but like as someone who is of that descent who grew up in the US, like as an actor, I would say your role is like the same way any artist's role is. It's like embodying stories that matter and telling them and telling them in ways that are authentic and sincere to what the lived experience of the of of the actual character or person is and I would say that like that role is more profound and more important for you because let's let's face the reality like for a play like Drowning in Cairo someone who was born and raised in Egypt who still lives in Egypt cannot go and act this play in a local theater in their hometown and so like the fact that you are representing them and hopefully like I hate Zoom for like plays. I hate Zoom theater. I don't want to make Zoom plays, but hopefully like a live stream one day. I don't know. I don't know if we actually have live streams in this production, but like for future things, I mean, um, like telling our stories in ways that are um, important for, for that in ways that are actually seen by people who they are about. And, and I have complicated feelings about that myself. Like just because I grew up in Egypt doesn't mean that I have the authority to tell the story. Like, I grew up between a bunch of places. I have a lot of class privilege. Um, I don't think my experience of queerness is the same as like your average Egyptian gay person. Um, and so, but like, and for a long time, I think between Drowning in Cairo and the project I'm currently working on, there was a solid couple of years that I was like, I shouldn't be telling queer Arab stories. But like, I also have privilege and I have training and I have passion and I have privilege of like, having built my career around telling stories, which is something that a lot of people can't do um, for a variety of economic, cultural, social, like security reasons. And so like, I may not be the best person to tell the story, but I can be conscious of that and try to bring right pe the right people, which is why I'm also passionate about producing and like being a literary manager in this theater. Um, I can be think about other ways for to cultivate that, but I think that's a profound question. As long as it's not pinkwashing, I mean, I do like like whatever. It, it is an excellent really question, amazing. really. <laughs> yeah, uh, it just felt and, funny and it, to be talking about pinkwashing while wearing all pink. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it's not related, Adam. It's okay. We can wear <laughs> I know. pink. I love it. I, I just want to say that uh, at some point we had a conversation about language in the play and. You know, it's a bilingual play, and I know that you, uh, you know, you have some drafts that the Arabic kind of is more at fifty percent or more. Yes. So, so that actually, like the this is, you know, this is a question that has been on my mind, and and you did speak, you know, briefly about this. But do you think it's important to to take these stories back to the communities that they came from, and and what would you need to do? Like, what should become Maybe something needs to be compromised to be able to do that, given the atmosphere and the, you know, hostility against um, homosexuality and queerness in the Arab world. So, is this something that's on your mind? For instance, in in response, I mean, you to and I have Chinese talked about culture. like a potential Beirut production down the line. There are yeah. a couple of places in the Arab yeah. world where where the where it's possible. Um, I think the story would have an impact with the Lebanese queer community as well. Um, Absolutely. We can't produce it in Cairo right now, but maybe we will in three decades. I don't know. Um, but I know that like, I've had to make, I wouldn't say compromises, but I've had to make adaptations or shifts mm -hmm. for it to like have a life on American stages. Um, and I have realized that like, it's also, again, the onus is not on me to tell the story of like for every Arab queer, um, what I can do is like if I'm developing a workshop for like new emerging queer playwrights or like teenagers to try and really include like a couple of Arab queer playwrights who maybe are not who didn't who are not gonna like go to NYU who are not going to um, have like the privileges or access that I have had the privilege of having in my life, but so that they can write in their communities and they can build with their communities and they can do the work that I can't like. I think I used to, again, a few years ago, uh, used to have this fantasy um, about like, I'm going to, um, one day I'm gonna come back to the Middle East and like, you know, start a theater company and do things for queer Arabs. And it's like, I could one day, but maybe I'm not the best person to do that. Maybe mm -hmm. what's best is for me to like, do the fundraising for that and empowers, not empower, but like give access or resources to someone else to do that. Um, 
because um, yeah, I think it's important to also know like where are not our strengths or our, our contexts. Yeah, absolutely. We 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 are at our time, but this is the last no summary episode for 2021, and I want to extend our time a little bit because we have one more message and question for you, Adam. Wendy, please. Hi, Adam. <laughs> A very, very good Whoa. afternoon to you. I hope you're doing very well, my friend. Um, I'm so excited to know that uh, you are one of the playwrights who is uh, going to be produced by Golden Thread Productions this year. That is uh, wonderful for the theater community, for the audiences that Golden Thread Productions has, because your work deserves to be in more main stages, uh, more than ever now. Uh, I think you know how highly I think of you and your writing, your commitment as an artist. And uh, of course, uh, I think the more the world has witnessed to that, the better it is. Also, at the same time, I think uh, I'm going to take this opportunity actually to ask you a question, which is about uh, how has your thought on uh, the relationship between form and content changed over the years? And I'm asking this because right from the time when you were a student, you were so uh, enthused by the idea of finding the right form and content. And in all these years, you have worked in quite a few different playwriting forms, from documentary to writing stuff that is more autobiographical, uh, and also being at the forefront of uh, queer writing. Uh, so I'm wondering, as we, as you move to another phase of your life of writing, how do you see the relationship between form and content emerge in your own work? Looking forward to your answer and to everything that you have to say in general and to more of your writing. Take care and bye-bye. Oh my God. Do you want to I tell love that I actually <laughs> referenced all the people that you brought in. It's I know it worked perfectly. I would I know people okay, might think like, that I promise you I actually did not know about this. I actually did I not know. know I know I was like smiling inside, you know, I was so happy. <laughs> You're referencing everyone. So um, <laughs> this is Abhishek Majumdar, a playwright, theater director, scenographer, visiting associate professor of practice of theater at NYU Abu Dhabi. And Abhishek is um, Adam's teacher and mentor. Yeah, so Abhishek is the person who taught me my first playwriting class when I was like 18. Um, oh my God. <laughs> he also would always ask me deep questions like this. And I always was like, I don't have a smart answer for you. You are like the smartest person I know. <laughs> Stop. Um, I would say, um, I think I used to be so... Um, this is embarrassing to say out loud. I used to be so anti-experimentation. I think I wanted to tell like the naturalist stories in the most traditional sense of that word. Like I wanted to just stage real life. Like I always was like, why can't dialogue just be like how we talk in real life? Very Chekhovian. And, and Abhishek was like, no, but there's there's more. Like that, you, that works for certain things and there's more. Um, and the, the first play I read in his class was very that, was very like uh, Chekhovian, he always described it as. And um, I think I've learned more than ever that most of the time um, I want form to be determined by content, which is to say that like, especially as I'm working across forms now, not just in live audiences, uh, but I've just seen a lot of, um, I've just like, I come up with ideas and I'm like, this is gonna be uh, like, one uh, two hour play and then I start writing it and I'm like actually maybe this is a screen thing or maybe maybe it's not linear like I was saying um and so content content for me has always been where I start and character as I said character is always where I start and that often then informs form so yeah well thank you so much I don't much, know what to Adam. say so I'm gonna <laughs> cry thank you I yeah so uh, I really, we, we just want to celebrate you, Adam, and tell you how much we are happy to be producing Drowning in Cairo uh, as part of our main stage season in 2022. Um, 
and and you know get to know you and again like a lot, you know create this chance for our community to get to know you and i'm i'm sure we're going to have many more of these conversations um we're going to be hosting a workshop hopefully in january around the play and we'll see like we'll we'll try as much as possible to engage our community in every step of the way so i just want to say that it's been such a privilege and um, pleasure to have you here with us today to close this, you know, no summary for 2021. I mean, I'm so, so grateful to you. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you more closely recently. And I look forward to all our future conversations and working together, hopefully soon, inshallah. Um, I'm so excited. Yeah, so, and I want to uh, thank, you know, the special guests, Karishma, Abishak, Adriana, also who appeared on video. So grateful for you and looking forward to connecting further with all of you. I would like to thank HowlRound for hosting the session and all of our sessions this year. The program offered nine new episodes in 2021. We hosted around 27 artists from various backgrounds and ethnicities, including playwrights, directors, storytellers, makeup designers, artistic directors, founding members of emerging MENA theater companies, Swana queer artists, cultural advisors from Turkey, Egypt, Afghanistan, Iran, Lebanon, Palestine, and the MENA diaspora. And all these episodes live on, on Golden Thread's website and on HowlRound. Thank you always to Wendy Reyes, Chris Steele for their technical support and to the rest of the Golden Thread small but mighty team, Michelle, Linda and Nadine. And big thank you to you, our audiences, without whom really nothing will make any sense. We love you and we hope to see you next year in person and online. If you're not already on our email list, please sign up today so that you stay on top of our programs and events. We just launched a new era campaign for Golden Thread. And if you would like to support our work and the voices we bring to you, please consider making a donation. More information on that on our website, goldenthread.org. We're always looking for volunteers and board members. So talk to us if you're interested. It really takes a village to make great art. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Adam and Amin, and goodbye for now. This was wild. I mean, Karishma, Ariana, Abhishek, I will definitely be sending you long, tearful messages, but thank you. Sahar, I can't believe you put this together. I don't know what to say. I can't wait to be in the rehearsal room again and with you, Adam. Hopefully, I mean, um, I'm teasing. Okay, I'll stop. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for having me. This was really wonderful and good to see you both. Love you both. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.